Welcome to Press Play. I'm Cedric Fisher. Happy Friday to all of you. Good to see you all again on a wonderful Friday. And if this is your first opportunity to experience an episode of Press Play, we are a great program in the family of fine multimedia programs for Black Video News Network. You can find us at blackvideonews.com. Uh, like our Facebook page, Black Book Studios, and our YouTube channel is Black Video Network, all one word, no spaces. Black Video Network, all one word, no spaces. You'll be able to find this episode, all previous ep episodes and future episodes of Press Play on that channel. Just go to the channel, look for the subscribe button. We appreciate you subscribing with us scroll through the episodes of press play find this one and press play okay COVID's still here and it is uh doing a number on us although the numbers have uh, improved over time and the governor recently uh relaxed some of the, the restrictions uh clubs and bars are not still not able to uh bring in patrons but restaurants have been, um, some of the restrictions with restaurants, parks, and that sort of thing has been relaxed. However, we wanna to continue to encourage each and every one of you in communities of color, this is largely our audience, communities of color, uh, COVID is still disproportionately impacting us, so make sure you continue to follow the guidelines of the medical experts put your mask on social distance here on the black book studios we have a divider up here it's maybe a little tough to see but it's a glass divider that uh, gives us our social distancing and of course take as good a care of yourself as you can uh, for those of you who are dealing with symptoms make sure you get out and get tested and uh, just be cautious and careful for, and look out for each other um, 141 new COVID cases yesterday, 214 hospital cases, and two new deaths yesterday. So we're at a, a total of 1,024 COVID deaths since this pandemic got started. That's important. Anyway, COVID's going to be with us for a good long while, folks. We all, we're always talking about it here at the offices in the studio that uh, we can we can already see past maybe even 2021 before some of these uh, nuances, if you want to call it that, or let's just say new ways of operating uh, go away. And we don't know what that looks like next post COVID because it could be a situation where formal meetings and those things are a thing of the past. But just uh, beware, COVID could be around for a good long while and, uh, you know, try and live your life. But of course, be cautious and careful. Um, all right. We've got uh, a, multi a plethora of multimedia here at Black Video News Network. Of course, so you know, on Press Play, we always feature a prominent guest. Someone's doing some exciting and uh, valuable and productive things in the uh African-American community or Central Texas or community of colors, colors, communities of color. Let me get that right. Communities of color. And we've got a special guest we're bringing on today. I wanted to mention before we go to our special guest that we've got a plethora of media here, including printed media. One of our special pieces is called Black Life Texas Magazine. It's a magazine that comes out occasionally, either monthly or bi-monthly. And we are currently working on our upcoming edition. It's going to be focused on education, all things education, as uh, and obviously things that really pertain to our audience, which means you. So in the spirit of education, we have today joining us a special guest by the name of Mr. Jose Messias. Macias, Macias, let me get that right. Um, thank you for joining us, Jose. Let me introduce you a little bit to Jose. Okay, he's the current representative for Alamo Colleges in District Two. Jose has an extensive background in nonprofit fundraising. Uh, he was also part of District Four for a good long while as uh, with with Judson, and uh, he is currently looking to be elected. He was appointed to his current seat, but looking to be elected to the seat 
with the upcoming election. And um, we want to welcome you to Press Play, Jose. Cedric, it is my honor to be here. Thank you so much. Very good. Before we get started, why don't you just go ahead and introduce our audience to who you are, your background, where you're from, that sort of stuff. Sure. Um, and before I do, I just want to also reiterate what you mentioned earlier about COVID-19 and its seriousness in this community. When, when, you, when I hear the numbers on the reports, uh, they're not just numbers. I mean, we've lost family to COVID this year. And so it's very real and, and, and of course it, it's made an impact. Whenever you, you lose a family member, I mean, they're, they're gone. And so, uh, yeah, just keep yourself safe and, and do the social distancing and do everything that needs to be done to, to keep minorities and individuals of color safe because they have been hit harder proportionally than some of our other populations. So anyway, it just matters. I just wanted to say that it was really moving what you started in terms of talking about that. So appreciate but that. But in terms of, of who I am, um, I'm still meeting a lot of wonderful folks. 12 months ago, I was appointed to the Alamo College's Board of Trustees. Um, I spent 10 years uh, representing the Justin ISD community um, out in the Converse and unincorporated area of Bear County. And so I've been in education for a while. And so the opportunity to go back to Alamo Colleges uh, was a profound one. So when I mean go back to, I'm a product of Alamo Colleges. I have my associate's degree from San Antonio College and I will give all the credit to Alamo Colleges for transforming my life. They really changed the whole trajectory of who I am and how I ended up to where I am now. Without them, I don't think I would be here. And I'll backtrack a little bit. When I was in high school, um, my college, my high school advisor had talked to me a little bit about college. And they said, what are you gonna do? And I said, well, I've already enlisted in the military. I you know, gave my life to the military. And she said, that's great because um, you wouldn't make it in college. I said, really? She said, no, mm. you just, just don't have the grades for it. Interesting. And uh, I was in the bottom quartile. I was in the top quartile, the bottom quartile of my class, which is pretty low. So you don't, <laughs> you don't want to end up there, but she was right, nevertheless. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going into the military. I spent some great time there, but in the back of my mind, I was always hearing I was not college material. And I'm a little bit of a rebel. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna get out of the military and go to college. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. I got out. I enrolled at San Antonio College, and um, lo and behold, I thought I was pretty big. Here I am, I'm in college, I'm showing my counselor. Well, guess what happened? I took my first semester, I failed every class. Second semester, oh, no. went back, reloaded, failed every class again. <laughs> I took the summer off, really just kind of defeated, and went back in the fall, changed my major, said maybe I'm in the wrong field, and I failed again. So talk about a whole year and a half of college, spent money, I mean, you're, and you didn't pass, at least in my case, I had to pass. I really had to reflect, uh, maybe I need to go back into the military. Maybe my high school counselor was right. She wasn't trying to be rude, just, mm -hmm. hey, I'm not ready, I can't do this. Um, but it was that fourth semester when I decided to go back one more time that I found myself. Mm -hmm. And when I found myself, everything changed. So when I tell you now that San Antonio College and the Alamo College system changed my life. Yeah. That it did. And that's partly why I'm here now, because I know that there are students that are coming out of high school that are um, told you're not college material, you're not ready. And a lot of them are students of color. And so there's some truth to some of that. So my job now is to help ensure that we provide that bridge, that resources, that support so that we don't have someone go through three semesters of failing. Because I can tell you, a lot of our students won't go back a second semester or a third semester. They're done after the first one. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to change the whole trajectory of our community and truly eliminate generational poverty, education is the key. Okay, very well said. Uh, you don't need any introduction. A lot of our audience already knows who you are, but for folks who are seeing or meeting you for the very first time, where, where are you from? Tell us where you're from. Uh, product of a military family. Okay. Uh, my parents grew born up Born in, in what town? 
the, um, my my parents were raised, they were born and raised in San Antonio. Okay. And then my father joined the military at 19 years of age, and he spent a career in the military over 22 years. And and as a military dependent, I mean, we lived everywhere. I went to kindergarten in Turkey. I went to elementary school in Washington D.C. Uh, I went to high school in Germany. So talk about a global perspective. Here I am, this kid just going everywhere every three to four years. Yeah. I ultimately graduated from high school in San Antonio my senior year at John Jay High School. But okay. that was my intro to my father retired at Lackland Air Force Base. And then, of course, I didn't stay long. I joined the military and I was stationed at, at Montgomery, Alabama at Maxwell Air Force Base. Uh, spent time as a medic in the military. and So that's pretty much how my beginnings uh, were. Uh, didn't really, was not really involved in the community. I uh, was uh, a young kid in the military and going to have fun and doing my job in the military was, was all I would do. Okay. Okay, we're learning a little about Jose. We're gonna take a break here and when we come back, we'll talk about some questions about his current election situation and uh, some plans he has going forward. You're watching Press Play. We'll be right back. This isn't about today. It's about the next 10 years. But this is something you can do today. You can make a difference today. By completing the 2020 census. The census impacts hospitals, schools, public transportation, and most importantly, our representation in government. It gives us an opportunity to be heard. It's easy. It's only 10 questions. So do your part. Go to 2020census.gov and complete the census today. What are you waiting for? Hello, this is Cornell with Frost Bank. Hi there, this is Terry with Frost. Good evening, this is Franklin. This is Robert with Frost. Hello, this is Rosemary with Frost Bank. One in three adults has prediabetes. Take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. Does your life matter? Education, health, and finance can determine your future and explain your past. Pick up the latest edition of Black Life Texas Magazine, a monthly outlook on life with an African-American focus. Life is what you make it, so live it in the black. Welcome back to Press Play. I'm Cedric Fisher. We're here today with Mr. Jose Macias, District 2 representative for Alamo Colleges. And we're having a candid conversation about his current work and his future work as he is running to be elected for the seat. Welcome back, Jose. So talk to us about your current line of work. What's a day in the life like for what you currently do? Uh, certainly. One thing that I get a lot of questions about is, uh, is this position a paid position as an elected official for Alamo Colleges? And it is not. I'm not compensated. It is a, a passion to serve and is why we're here. And I do have a day job, and so I work in the nonprofit sector uh, for the National Multiple Sclerosis Society in helping the community. So after I do my nine to five, if you will, mm -hmm. um, by the way, my employer gives me great flexibility to have meetings during the day as long as I cover my bases. Sure. So when I get back to the day in the life of my work as a trustee for Alamo Colleges, it is about accessibility. I'm a big advocate for being accessible to the community. I cannot represent a community if I'm not having two-way dialogue, if we're not communicating. So being accessible is, is job number one, which I will give strangers in my community my cell phone number, call me so that we can talk. Because if there's a concern that you have about Alabama colleges, it's my job to listen, understand, and communicate back with what we're doing. So that is like job number one for me. So a day in the life is I may have two or three conversations uh, daily with folks in the community talking about a mixture of things. Mm -hmm. So as long as that communication is occurring, that's positive because people are getting their, their needs met and questions answered. But more or less, when I look at my job, the whole function is to look at ways to impact District 2 
and impact district two through the arena uh, mechanism of education. And so in Alamo colleges, we have the benefit of not only working towards an associate's degree or transfer credits, but also workforce development. And in this day and age, getting a workforce certification can make all the difference between a minimum wage job and a job that pays 15, 20, $30 an hour. It is significant. So ensuring that we have the community coming into those programs is at utmost importance to me. Right now, we're about to, we're actually in year one of the Alamo Promise. And are you familiar with the Alamo Promise? No. The Alamo Promise is our promise of tuition free college. And right now, in phase one, 25 high schools are eligible for the Promise program. And what that means is if you're a senior in one of those 25 high schools, you can attend Alamo Colleges next year tuition free. I mean, nothing, which means if you want to go for a workforce certification, if you want a degree, if you want to just transfer after two years, you can get that done at Alamo Colleges. And the whole concept behind it is to truly end generational poverty. It doesn't matter um, your economic background. The idea is to move an entire community forward. And in District 2, we have a full range of individuals who live on one end of the spectrum of poverty to the other end. We want to move an entire community forward. The city of San Antonio has a 47% college attainment level. After five years of the Promise program, which that's what we have right now in the budget, five years worth, mm -hmm. our goal is to be at 70%. Okay. So to have a 70% college attainment number in our community means we change the face of our community. Mm -hmm. we, cha we change the economic drivers because we have an educated workforce. Um, everything can change. And in District 2, where three of the top five most impoverished zip codes reside, I am hitting it hard to ensure that our community understands the benefit of tuition-free college. There are no barriers to getting to that next level. Hmm. The only barrier is if you do not want to seek it. And, and that's a whole other, another ball of wax to open up because sure uh, we got to give our students the ability to believe. Are you guys promoting this program or? We, we are, and, and phase one, as I mentioned, they have 25 high schools. Mm -hmm. When we go into phase two, it'll be 45 high schools. Wow. It'll be every high school in Bear County, mm -hmm. with the exception of charter schools. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm starting a conversation in my office to not exclude those charters that serve Title I populations, economically disadvantaged kids, because those children need the same support. So we're working towards that. And I can tell you the promise can change everything. So when I say I'm here to provide a promise of a better future, I mean that. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. I shared this with my advisory committee. By the way, I formed a District 2 advisory committee. I understand I'm the first trustee ever to officially form an advisory committee to the office. Okay. And so we're already meeting. And what I let them know is that in my district, three high schools of the 25 that are part of the promise program were are in the program. Judson had 90% of its seniors sign up to go. Wagner had 100% of its seniors to, to go. But Sam Houston had in the 70 percentile. So that tells me we had a disconnect somewhere because Sam Houston seniors did not save their seat to go to tuition-free college. They don't have to, but if they don't save their seat during the time period of October through March, they can't say in June, oh, I want to go to Alamo Colleges now tuition-free. They didn't save their seat. So I've been working with my advisory committee and with community leaders to ensure that this year Sam Houston is at 100% and that we have Wagner and Judson because we want to give that opportunity and not lose out on an opportunity for tuition free college. That's fantastic. Um, and the program Alamo Promise is already in motion? It is. It's, it's in phase one this year and next year we will evaluate if we can go to phase two. Yeah. The only reason we're even talking about it is because COVID-19 has impacted everything. So we may need to reboot and go into phase one for one more year. But I tell folks, this is still five years total. It's not going to be with us after five years. Yeah. So we'll negotiate and we'll talk about the success of the program. Because one other thing I'll tell you, if Tuition free doesn't mean you're going to pass. Just like I shared earlier, mm -hmm. I went through three semesters before I passed my first class. So we want to make sure that our students are successful. So we're building support programs that I call Alamo Plus that will offer more support to those first time in college students, many of which are students of color.
we cannot afford to miss this opportunity to push them forward. Outstanding, outstanding. So that's a heck of an accomplishment. What are some of your other accomplishments that you've achieved well, since uh, taking the seat? I have to be candid. The Alamo Promise came before my arrival. My my colleague, our former colleague, uh, Denver McClendon, who, who I took his seat when he stepped down, was part of a lot of that movement. And I give him a lot of credit and my colleagues on the board for their vision. But where I have come in is I've added that extra layer of ensuring that the right resources are there because it's about student success. Like I mentioned earlier, it's great to have tuition free and I'm supporting that initiative. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have student success as the outcome, then it, it didn't matter. It, resources right. were wasted. So I bring the lens with my experience with Justin ISD K through 12 to helping support our first time in college students. And that's where I feel the value of my experience is ensuring that we are building those safety nets mm -hmm. to ensure students succeed. So that's what I'm really proud of. But there are additional activities that I've been involved in. One that I would say I'm real proud of is when COVID-19 hit, yeah. we made sure that every student had a laptop or uh, the resources to learn from home. At the time that COVID hit, we estimated 10% of our population did not have the software or the ability or the internet to learn remotely. And many of that 10% were those students on the bottom end of the spectrum you know, in, in poverty. Sure. So we can say now that every student has the resources that they need to succeed. Back to the whole thing, student success, right? So that was a big accomplishment that we ended up addressing right out of the gate to ensure that student success was met. But the other things that I'm really proud of, I've also started the ball on an African American Studies program at St. Phillips. Okay. To my amazement at HBCU, there's not an African American Studies program. I, I, I'm, I mean, shocked, really. Mm -hmm. But I will say, Palo Alto College just started their Mexican American Studies program three years ago. <laughs> so it's not like we've had it forever. But the fact that Palo Alto has one, it doesn't. It's beyond time. Mm -hmm. St. Phillips needs one. So I've initiated the conversations, the meetings, the, all the processes for establishing an African American Studies program at St. Phillips. And so, if I get to see the vision completed, that should happen pretty much within the next year. So that's my estimation that we have a formal program. And mm -hmm. in addition to that, I put a lot of effort in, in supporting our small business and small businesses of color to be exact. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I, I found out in meeting with folks when I was uh, appointed was that we were not as inclusive and diverse in our field of business partners at the district, at Alamo Colleges. Yeah. And although we have an impeccable record of being diverse and inclusive, it, it just didn't feel that way when I was talking to business leaders in, in the community that, that we're not being given an opportunity. So just this past Tuesday, we passed the first policy amendments to start creating opportunities for more businesses of color to do work at Alamo Colleges. So we're, it's, it's a first step. I have a broader vision of what that would ultimately look like, but the first step to recognize that there is a problem and that policy was changed unanimously by board vote on Tuesday mm -hmm. so that we start to really recognize it. One of the key parts that I've identified is that our current policies allow for our general contractors, our big businesses to subcontract work. Who they pick, they can pick vendors from all around Bear County and Bear County and they tend to do. They pick businesses in Houston or Austin or and they're not picking businesses in Bear County at a greater level. Mm -hmm. So one of my recommendations um, would be that 50% of our business be from businesses of color in Bear County only. Very nice. And once we yeah. do that, it will change. Right now I'm getting the numbers. I can tell you it's nowhere near 50%. If it's a 25%, I'd be happy, but we're getting that data so that I can make that policy recommendation. And, and I've had a lot of conversations, even with the heads of general contracts that say 50% is workable. Mm -hmm. We understand the need to keep tax dollars in the community. And of course, I see the need to increase our diversity within Bear County. Okay, that's phenomenal. That's fantastic work. So that's one of your current uh, activities that, that's in motion. So should you get elected, what are some of your other plans for 
what you really want to do for well, the district it, in regards to Alamo colleges. I'm, I'm going to tell you the thing about the policy steps that we've taken, it's only the first step. I, I would like to see it through because I'm one of the only board members that's been pushing for subcommittee men, meetings of the board, have been pushing for inclusion and diversity. And as I mentioned, it's not done yet. There are still steps that need to be done to ensure that we get there. Mm -hmm. And so I'm making myself accountable to getting that job done because I've heard you know, people have talked about it. In fact, I had one constituent tell me, We've been talking about this for 30 years, Mr. Macias, and nothing has happened. And I'm like, well, dude, I've been here for 12 months, 12 months. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, I'm making things happen. Sure. If given more time, I will finish what I started in terms of what I promised to my community about diversity and inclusion for our business partners. More importantly, though, I also want to ensure that we realize 70 percent college attainment. To me, in District 2, I'm looking at that very, very closely. Because I do not want to end at five years and, and we did not exceed those benchmarks. Okay. You know, the, the District 2 community is in, it needs that support. Mm -hmm. So my, my experience will enable me to evaluate that. So going forward, I'll have an opportunity to do that as well. And to me, that's extremely important. Um, the African American Studies Program. I understand that that ball has pick, been picked up many times. I'm not the first person that's picked up that ball. but if I'm not there to finish it, I don't know if it'll happen. And again, I'm putting myself on that accountability track. Mm -hmm. I want an African American Studies program. So okay. I'll continue to work with my community and ensure that we get there. All of that, I, I won't say that my my uh, opponent wouldn't want to do those things. Um, we met with the editorial board last week and she echoed that she would support a lot of these same initiatives. But I'm there, I'm doing the work, I have the experience, and I feel like can, I can make myself accountable. And then lastly, the creation of that D2 advisory committee, we're about to get to that next level of creating subcommittees so that we can actually evaluate and get some real results done. And I'm going to tell you the feedback from the advisory committee, phenomenal. They said they finally feel like someone's listening to them. And so a lot of good things and, and obviously more to come because having a pulse of the community is important because you can address needs as they continue if we have problems with efficiency. Um, one thing that I haven't mentioned that's extremely important is on the workforce development side. Our, our East Side Education Training Center, our Etsy, is a partnership with SAISD, but the facility is an old elementary school and it was never designed to be a true workforce development center. For some reason, it did not get added to the bond two years ago, mm -hmm. some other centers were. So I will fight and ensure that we have a brand new facility to offer the programming that will enable the right workforce programs to impact our community. And that's not really, we're, we're not there yet. Okay. So those are sort of the one, two, three, fours. I have a 10 point plan even on my website, um, which is Macias4AlamoColleges.com. The thing is, we gotta get to work. And so all of these things I've told you, if I accomplish just these four things, mm -hmm. that's going to be big. It's going to be big for District 2. That's outstanding. Before we go to break, let's ask you question, this question. Um, what's your take on just education in the age of COVID? How, how do you feel about it? Because it looks like it's going to be with us for a while. You know, I, I um, truly believe that we can move forward in the age of COVID. Uh, it is not an ideal situation. There are situations where student training and experiences in labs are compromised because they have to be remote so you don't get the same feel but we have to move forward we cannot afford to pause um, i did uh, an assessment and when lyndon Baines johnson declared war and poverty in 1965 64 mm -hmm. and to still have zip codes in my district that are still impoverished we don't have time so COVID cannot be a pause for us so in terms of moving forward, we have to move forward, offer the resources, offer the support, ensure that people can learn remotely. As a matter of fact, I've supported the district purchasing hotspots. So we're actually building towers within Bear County that are for Alamo College students. So they don't have to go to a parking lot or a library. Or they will have a tower within their area nice. to log in. Very That's nice. the commitment long term to ensuring that we build the infrastructure and we build student success. Okay. 
We're talking to Jose Macias. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back on Press Play. Because the fight isn't over yet. You will see me choose to protect my community by wearing a face cover. And even with my face covered. You will see me. As a son. As a man with a never quit attitude. As a fighter for change. Join me in wearing a face cover. To help stop the spread of the coronavirus. Because this is one small act of kindness that has the power to make a big difference. Before we celebrate the freedom most Americans have, we must fight for the freedom all Americans deserve. Because all lives can't matter until black lives matter. Nothing to do this week? Don't miss another event. Go to blacksinsanantonio.com for our event calendar. The home of the largest business directory in San Antonio with an African-American focus. Sign up today for our weekly e-blast and text message alerts. Help us make this a better community. Connect. Empower. Grow. Welcome back to Press Play. We're here with Jose Macias, District 2 representative for Alamo College. We're having a candid conversation about his current seat and his life with the district going forward. So welcome back, Jose. Let's talk about this question. It's a little controversial, but I'm sure you've heard it before. And, and, and our audience, I think, is, is very interested in hearing about this. This is a seat that historically was an African-American in the seat. Do, did you walk into any type of negative reception? How did, were you, did you feel welcome? And how are you going to approach that going forward? You know, that, is, that, that was the, the biggest issue, really, uh, when I came in. I considered um, what it would look like before, but I never expected it this way. And I'll elaborate what I, what I mean. The issue itself is, is a poignant one and a very uh, serious one. I mean, I'm a big advocate for diversity and inclusion. And as we talked earlier, the initiatives that I'm working on really talk about that. I value it. As a matter of fact, as a student at San Antonio College, where I told you I found myself, one of the first things that I remember doing is protesting for affirmative action. I was saying our administration does not look diverse. Where is the diversity in our administration as a student at SAC? So, I kind of understood back then the importance of diversity and inclusion and have been an advocate ever since regarding it. To me, it's, it's near and dear to me. Um, I'll take one, one st step back just to kind of say this because I don't talk a little bit, a lot about this. I want to take a little moment to talk about this. Uh, the Sutton family, um, my family, my Macias family, settled in San Antonio in the 1920s. And when they settled there, they literally lived across the street from the Sutton family. In fact, the Suttons would break bread. They were friends. My cousin, who's still alive, would tell me when she was a little girl, she would run into their house. And, and, and I feel a sort of uh, an honor because a Sutton did represent and serve on this seat too. And so now I'm here and I would love to have a conversation if I could and ask him what his what he was going through at his time. So I digress a little bit, but for me, it's, it's really personal because my family, my grandparents met on Dawson and Cherry Street, right there in the heart of the east side next to where the Sun family lived. So when I walked there, I was part of that community. I'm part of that. That's where my family's beginnings were. So the issue of diversity has been a, one on my mind. And at Judson, I was blessed to represent a community that was 30% African American. And so I was reelected and elected for a total of three terms, which meant my community loved the work I was doing. They, they saw how I would fight for my community and ensure that we did things to move District 4 at the time for Judson forward. One of the things that I can tell you, I helped bring together free SAT testing and SAT prep when I was at Judson. And I, it, it didn't matter, it impacted students of color who would never have picked up a pen to take an SAT. But here they are now thinking about college. And you know who benefited the most? Uh, our athletes who all of a sudden saw from their coaches, if you take this SAT and you get a scholarship, it could change everything. Hmm. So 
to say that 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 doesn't matter to me would be would be incorrect. Yeah. So the, the issue itself is a critical one, and I will tell you one of my um, most heartwarming experiences was when I was putting gas at the gas station here on WW White Road. And I had this one lady, African American, step out of the car. She said, "Mr. Macias," and I went, uh, "Yes, ma'am." You're the Alabama College Board representative, aren't you? I said, yes, ma'am. You're doing an outstanding job. I said, well, thank you. I said, and I've been hearing this rhetoric about you not being black. I said, you know what? You could be pink for all I care because it's about getting the job done. Yeah. It's about results, about results. About accountability. And that's what you're going to get from me. Mm. And so anytime that issue comes out, I remind folks, I'm in the fight with you. You know, black and brown, we're minorities that that have been hurt, we've been devastated, and we need to come together. And yeah. this is that time now. So I would hope that folks don't get hung up on skin color. Mm -hmm. They look at an individual's record, their heart, their passion, their experience. And in my case, look at what I bring to the table. I've had the blessings of 12 months to show you what I'm capable of. And that's a blessing that I can only thank God for, because if I couldn't come in cold, I wouldn't even have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So here I am putting on the table what I'm doing and, and hopefully the community gives me an opportunity um, and allows me to continue to do the work that I'm doing. So you've got a track record already. You just need to have another opportunity to finish your work. Th that would be it. And I'm going to tell you something that a lot of folks don't realize that this election is a special election. If I win this seat, and again, I'm, my campaign team, we're fighting. We're, not, we're definitely fighting to win this seat. Mm -hmm. It's only for 18 months. A typical term is six years. I'm only finishing the term. So I tell my community, give me 18 more months. If I stink it up and I don't live to some of the things that I promised, mm -hmm. you can boot me out in 18 very short months. Typically, it would take six years. That's the beauty of this situation. Mm -hmm. So give me that opportunity to continue doing the work that I'm doing. And, you know, and then we get to that May 2022 and I get an opportunity to win a six year term. You'll know exactly who I am and what I've done. Outstanding. Jose, we have the privilege of interviewing some very distinguished guests. Most of the folks that, that come through the doors to sit at the table here in the hot seat uh, <laughs> are highly accomplished, very talented. Um, have done some very significant work as, as you have. Leaders, these are all typically leaders, movers and shakers. Um, leaders tend to be readers. And I asked this question to all of our guests, to each of our guests. They tend to always have a book that they refer to on a regular basis. It could be daily, weekly, monthly, sometime once a year they pick it up. Every two years they dust it off and they revisit <laughs> that particular book. That book is typically found on their nightstand, Jose. What book is on your nightstand? Well, that's a really good question. And I can tell you, I have three, four favorite books. I mean, obviously the Bible is one of them, right. um, but I do have the, um, the Mayor, which is a book written by Nelson Wolf when he was in governance. Mm -hmm. and, and I do read that from time to time to kind of understand where the beginnings of our city came in terms of its economic development and try and understand what he was going through. But I'll be candid. I've done more reading of newspapers than anything. Newspapers? Yeah, I never throw one away. Okay. Ever. I'm actually reading some newspapers back in 2010 hmm. because I refuse to throw them away. Mm -hmm. And what's really wonderful about that is perspective is different. And had I read it back in 2010 or 2013, whatever the date is, seeing it now in 2020, mm -hmm. it's different. So I totally agree. I do like to read, but okay. right now between work, campaigning and all, it's kind of hard to find some time. But sure. when I am doing so, I'm reading old newspapers and learning things from a different lens. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that is the most invaluable thing I've ever had an opportunity to do. Okay, very interesting. So you keep an archive of newspapers, or you kind of oh, yeah, organize in your garage? Yeah, categorized or? under politics, under interest. <laughs> it's just I love newspapers, and I, if I ever have to prove it, I'll bring out my big notebooks. That's to me, that is that's just something I enjoy doing. Last question. Our viewers here are uh, thrilled to know you, and uh, we want to encourage you with your pursuit of uh, being elected for the very first time in the seat. Um, here's your opportunity to 
ask to make your ask how can we help you how can we support you how can folks get in touch with you well I, i've been blessed with a, a lot of support uh, from my community and i'll say because serving judson for 10 years i made a lot of friends and i made a lot of friends because i would do my job and i would show uh, what was needed I've been a big transparency person, a big accountability person. So if you are interested in helping, if you visit my website, which again is MacciasRowellCollegeS.com, um, there's opportunity to sign up to volunteer. In fact, as I told you earlier, my cell number is 210-386-0075. You can call and text me, and I definitely could use your help on the campaign trail. Uh, if you just want to know more about the Alamo Promise or some of the workforce uh, recovery initiatives that we have for the city currently, which we didn't mention, but they're pretty special. Um, I'm happy to not only ask for your help, but also give help where I can. Excellent. Jose, thank you for being on the show. You're quite welcome. Jose sir. Macias, District 2 representative for Alamo Colleges, running for election for another term. Thank you for joining us here on Press Play every week. You can join us here, same time, same channel. Black Video Network in your YouTube space bar, all one word. You can find this particular episode of Press Play. We'll see you back here again next week. Thank you for joining us.